Welcome everybody. This is a session about mutation testing in practice. My name is Vadim Markelov. I'm a Ukrainian and I work as a full stack software engineer uh, with experience of multiple projects uh, that involved uh, different proportions of front-end and back-end development. And uh, currently I'm working as a technical Java lead at ISML. When I joined the company, I was impressed by complexity of the problems that should be solved. Um, it involves equipment and a software to guide this equipment to create the uh, nanostructures. On the right side, you can see the electronic microscope picture of uh, some microchip, and it involves multiple small elements that uh, located in different levels and layers and they should have precise dimensions and alignment to make the chip work. And the beautiful part of it is that if you look uh, on the microchips when they just finished uh, printing, uh, you can see the colorful rainbow effect uh, on the left side of the picture. This is a diffraction pattern that created by the surface of a microchip and it's affecting the light color. So this beautiful effect actually can be found in the nature so I really like to uh, draw some parallel between uh, what we do with uh, chip making and eventually what nature can do. So you can see that uh, the surface of uh, butterfly wings also has a nanostructures. Nanostructures like on the right, they really look like microchips uh, connection points and they also create uh, wonderful colorful effects. To achieve this, level of precision and eventually functionality of uh, uh, finished microchip products, you really have to think about the quality. And what I would like to focus as a session is um, what quality means for you as a developer and what kind of tools you have to, uh, to measure it objectively and understand what's going on with your projects. So mutation testing practice today uh, will highlight uh, this kind of questions. So what is a strong test suite? So we will discuss what kind of test suite exists and uh, what kind of um, covering coverage they provide for you. Um, we will also try to understand um, the quality of this test suite. So does it provide you with the confidence uh, that you covered all possible uh, edge cases of your functionalities that you require to implement and the possible future life cycle of a project. So how reliable and robust uh, it will be uh, during the development uh, lifetime. I will also try to explain for you why would you like to insert bugs? It may sound ridiculous, but it's actually really interesting concept that I uh, learned from myself. And um, I will show it on some examples. And in more uh, pragmatic uh, parts of the presentation, there would be uh, definitions about the mutation testing process, uh, type of mutators, all kind of uh, uh, vocabulary you need to know uh, to work with mutation testing, um, some overview of available frameworks and tools that you can use as a Java developer or as a team. And eventually um, my experience about uh, integration of these tools and this methodology with the team uh, workflow. So mutation testing in practice starts with the first question about the quality. What does it mean for you? So as soon as you start any project, you have some, uh, some business need for it, some features that you want to implement. And as soon as you created your proof of concept, you just go and manually test it and then you can understand that you're satisfied with a function. Uh, you can be happy just doing the few tests uh, on your own, but eventually all products is growing and just running a few uh, manual tests will never uh, protect you from some kind of regressions on unexpected problems that final user can have. And eventually most of us, independently of a company or technologies that we use, will come up to this uh, famous uh, pyramid of testing that describes uh, all the process of uh, uh, quality assurance. So on the top of the pyramid, this manual test that we're starting from, and eventually 
you will try to automate whatever you do manually you can always automate so you will create some kind of end-to-end -end test that uh, will just click uh, on the user interface for you and make sure that uh, correct information shown on the screen but it's usually really long and expensive to run so as more features you get the more end-to-end -end tests you will uh, have to create and more time it will take for you to run all of them or you will have to uh, uh, use more powerful infrastructure to run all these tests faster. So the pragmatic approach is just to go a little bit different levels to test something that uh, is smaller and easier and cheaper to uh, implement and test. So you will eventually end up creating some integration tests or uh, some people name it component tests when you augment some of the environment of some components uh, with mocks and continue with your tests so it becomes cheaper faster and easier to uh, to maintain and even if you want to get faster feedback about your changes you eventually will have to create some unit tests i think everyone knows this pyramid and the meaning of it i just wanted to remind you about uh, uh, what levels exist and the price for having each of them. So on the top is a super long and expensive, on the bottom is a super fast and cheap. Uh, but there is a tons of unit tests that uh, you may not even visit in your project for, for years, depending on the size of it, of course. And um, how do you ensure that um, this test is really helping you. So the idea of the testing pyramid is to give you help and assistance uh, during your development cycle. And here I will try one uh, feature that uh, will be probably good to use in the Q&A session later. So please um, take out your smartphones or some other device with camera and QR code reader and collect some data for me. So we will have some interesting thing to discuss later. So the question for this QR code um, sounds like that. Who has unit tests in their projects? So question is super simple. I think everyone knows the right answer for that, but you can also provide the honest answer for that. So it's uh, anonymous voting. So except of a QR code, you can also use on the top of the slide, uh, the code, and go to the website uh, yourself and uh, just submit your vote. We would be able to view the statistics at the end. Would be really interesting to see uh, who was the proportion between of uh, having unit tests and not unit tests and not having it in our audience today. Then another question that uh, actually in the core of uh, this presentation is do you always trust the tests of the app you are given so just imagine you're joining the team or you inheriting some of the project or you ask to help with uh, development uh, in some other team and do you have this question in your mind that is it good coverage there uh, do they test everything? Can I change this part of code? And I know that the test suite will back me up and highlight some regressions that I create. So please think about it and use another QR code and another code on the top to answer to that question. And uh, so this is about, do you trust, do you always trust the test of the app you are given to work with? So please, yes or no, just two options. So, um, Every developer eventually have to get this um, sense of confidence when he working on some application and um, will he create regressions or will his colleagues create regressions or some new team members will create regressions. So I'm trying to understand, I tried to understand for many years, what is a really strong test suite means. So uh, where is this boundary when you stop investing uh, in more tests uh, to be really happy and proud and confident during all kind of demos or deployments. So imagine another situation, for example, what if like this, uh, you are hiring uh, or taking into the team uh, the intern. So the person who doesn't know and doesn't have to know from start 
all the intricacy of your application and maybe all the features, but uh, the help of this person is really valuable. And for example, really a big contribution uh, could be produced through the short period of time. You really would like to have this situation covered and be confident even if a crazy uh, refactoring uh, taking start. So I was actually in the same place as this cat uh, maybe a year ago when I joined SML. I also seen the uh, huge code base uh, to achieve uh, uh, the lithography and creation of the microchips and controlling software. And I was actually thinking, does it all tests help me? Does it back me up? Because the complexity of a problem is just huge. So you have to have this notion of um, uh, good test suites and confidence that they're covering it all. So that's one of the situations. And how do you, for example, usually make a conclusion that, yes, my software tested really well. Yes, it will prevent for any unintended changes that uh, will catch all kinds of uh, feature regressions and other things. So the simplest way is probably to use uh, the code coverage and most of the teams around the world and, and across multiple technologies use this approach. They look into code coverage metrics. So you just know which kind of lines of code have been exercised by the tests and you try to figure out, is it like all of the codes that I wrote covered by it or not? And the uh, ratio of what is covered and total amount of code will show you the uh, code coverage value. And if it's high enough, you uh, feel confident. And most of the team define some kind of standard, how much code coverage they have uh, to achieve to get this uh, stability and confidence in the team. But I will try to explain to you the situations when this will not help you. And you would like to see some extra dimension on the uh, metrics of, uh, of, your, of your tests. So, for example, the quality of testing. Uh, had you ever thought about quality of tests themselves? So not about uh, quality of your application that you can uh, ensure by test, but the, how test is written. Do, do they focus on things that you want to be tested and to be protected from accidental change? So the, how to test the test. So for example, uh, this piece of code, um, this is just simple um, helper deals and we will just fantasize now that uh, we may have some uh, functions that will give us a simple answer uh, is a number uh, non-negative. So uh, I want to uh, have that uh, zeros and all positive numbers will return true and all the negative numbers will return false. So. Uh, this kind of code could be exist in, uh, in some uh, code base. And eventually some good developer will create as a unit test to cover it all. So as you can see, um, to really uh, cover most of the, uh, the simple function, you will have to come up at least with three tests. So to test for the positive numbers, some edge case of zero and test for the negative numbers. This is a like bulletproof coverage you cannot really complain or add something or thing. Uh, if you agree with me, then you would be just smiling. Yeah, but this is a really simple example. What's the point here? And the point here is that uh, on the top, you can see the uh, value of a coverage, 100% coverage. Most of the tools that you would be using uh, will say to you about this piece of code, 100% coverage. So, okay, nice. So let's uh, go forward and check the same code just losing some of the test methods. So now we have only one test. So it will only assert for the positive numbers. And if you run the coverage tools, they will probably say you about 100% coverage. So 100% line coverage will be for sure displayed for you in many of the tools. You may know about extra dimensions of uh, coverage metrics, for example, the uh, branches, and uh, you may get more insights of what actually covered, what's not. Uh, and branches is really good um, extra metric uh, of the coverage to take in account. 
but uh, there is much more to um, um, uh, to discover in this topic. And the, the masterpiece of today, it would be also 100% coverage in the coverage reports, but completely not covering you at all. So this is a unit test that actually exercising the code in line 13. So it, it actually been there. So the coverage tool will be completely right. You exercise the code in specific uh, util class, but you hadn't made any assertions. So this happens a lot in legacy projects and you will encounter them in your career and you will have to deal with that. And not always uh, greenfield projects would be on your plate. So sometimes this kind of situations can happen. The sources of these uh, problems uh, could be uh, multiple and it also could be tackled in many different ways. So with uh, code linting and uh, all other tools that can uh, try to help you to highlight this kind of uh, really logical mistakes of the developers, but um, not always uh, you can rely and have it configured correctly. So what kind of thing you have to think in this moment of time? So who is testing the test? How can you ensure the quality of it? And then like immediately simple idea, naive, okay, if I can use test to test application, then I should write another test to test the tests. But of course it will not work. And um, to, uh, to more highlight what I'm talking about is uh, to show you this picture of a bicycle that securely locked uh, on a parking lot. It looks like uh, everything been done correctly. So the lock is there and it's even locked and it has some level of security, uh, probably some uh, labels that cl uh, classifying it. And uh, yeah, but it wasn't really protecting this bicycle from being stolen. So when I'm joining the project, I, for example, first see the, some coverage statistics and some different metrics, and then I see coverage 89%. And then I'm thinking, is it good enough? Does this 89% really help me as a developer. And in this situation, you may imagine the relation between test and application. So test con testing the application features and ensure that application is good enough. But to test test, you can use your application code actually. So you can reverse um, your point of view and now you will understand that actually application is the best test suite for your tests. Because as soon as something will go wrong with application, the tests will start fail or not fail. So you can figure out which part of the application you uh, can tamper with and it would be detected and which part is not. So you have all in place to really extract extra metrics uh, from, uh, from your coverage uh, of application. So, there is really interesting technique so uh, that you can apply. You can try to challenge your test suite by introducing the bugs. This is the only way to really find is this test suite good enough or not. So imagine you have a piece of code on top um, that um, the function that should return a Boolean value to evaluate if some number is between uh, left and right boundary, not including the boundaries. So if you don't have any tests uh, for this kind of uh, functionality, then you can introduce this kind of bug. For example, the requirement was to not include boundaries, but now you will include them. And then you run the test suite and it say everything still is good. So in this situation, uh, you found that your test suite knows good enough. So after this kind of exercise, try to break it. Try to pretend that you are a new developer and you uh, just changing things and inject some bugs here and there in some, uh, in some logic, in some mathematics, and you will find out, is it covered or it's not? Even if the coverage report says that the um, uh, code, uh, test code uh, executed this part of your application, like we've seen earlier. So it could be just a uh, system out and then yes, coverage reports, uh, reports has been done. And after that, you will un unveil that you need extra tests. For example, this kind of test will immediately uh, cover this kind of defects. So you can um, then test uh, again your assumption, is it good enough or not, by uh, adding unit tests 
uh, putting bug in and now your test suite will start to scream, oh my God, you have a regression. So this technique uh, is exactly what mutation testing is about. So you're trying to use your application as a best companion for your test suite to evaluate the test suite. But uh, we are all developers. We don't want to do it manually. We can automate all of uh, this stuff and there is a uh, tooling available for that. So mutation, the testing process um, consists of uh, three main phases. So uh, first phase is production code is mutated. So your original implementation code get uh, changed in some specific way. And this represents, for example, defect that new developer will introduce or you forgot and just introduce some regression by yourself. So this version of the code, uh, buggy code will be named mutant. Then um, your tests are run against this version of a code and then you can have only two outcomes or the test suite will say everything is fine this is really uh, like actually bad or a test suite will fail and scream that yes i detect some changes that's what you want to achieve so uh, every killed uh, every change uh, mutation of your code that's been captured by the test suite uh, will get the term of a killed mutant and every change that went unnoticed it actually will be survived mutant. And uh, on the step three, you want to derive the metrics of uh, how much mutants survive uh, and how much mutants are skilled. And that would be your mutation score. So some value in percentage that uh, really similar to coverage, but it actually gives you extra dimension to understand how good is your test suite. So um, some terms about uh, what is uh, mutation testing can do with your source code. Um, so concept of uh, mutators. Mutators, it's some um, specific type of change. So mathematical mutators will try to uh, change the arithmetical operation, for example, from plus to minus or from minus to plus and vice versa. Unary operators would be also inverted uh, and um, uh, example mutators of conditional boundary. So also change condition to include or not include uh, the border uh, boundary of some uh, evaluations. The same thing uh, about uh, reversing conditions, um, removing conditions that could, for example, create infinite loops or uh, incorrect loops. Uh, or for example, if statements, they can also become irrelevant because uh, uh, yeah, the mutator will just replace the whole nice calculation of some logical expression to just uh, uh, true or false. And it will exercise be exercised again your test suite. The same thing, really interesting mutator, just remove the code and see what will uh, be happening. So also really good feature to understand, is it important uh, to have this code for, for um, perspective for test suite. But sometimes uh, you can really use it to detect some dead codes uh, that's not important anymore. Or for example, uh, it could be just code that creates some side effects like logging and other things, but then you can um, tackle it a little bit differently uh, during the mutation tests. So this is an idea of uh, mutation tests. And I hope you understand why would you want to use uh, uh, bug injections to, to your code to try to get some better uh, understanding of quality of tests that you have. And then the main question, do you need this? Uh, in most cases, you will, uh, you will need it and you will want it, especially if you are onboarding uh, the, some uh, legacy project or you get a knowledge transfer from other teams. So it's not so old application, but just you have to uh, become an extra capacity to implement some features. And you have to know what's going on with the database. In this case, uh, the best way uh, to get um, uh, this level of confidence, to get this feeling, yes, I understand uh, uh, what I will be breaking or not, is to apply mutation testing and just, uh, uh, just make it proof that uh, it will uh, improve your development process. So what exists there uh, for you to leverage? So we're now going to the tools uh, section. So how to use them, uh, what to choose from. So I tried to uh, outline it in the time perspective. 
So on the left, uh, from left to right, from the oldest one that gets any updates that I can track uh, uh, through the open source communities to the latest ones that really maintained and I use, for example. So the really one that's really working and I'm using, uh, it's a bit uh, really a good tool for the uh, Java development. So it's maintained today and it's uh, up to date. Um, minus four years backwards, it was last contributions happening and some updates about Vue Java. Um, and even more in the past is it actually, uh, I think if it's something more older than four years uh, contributed or changed, it's like infinity in the modern uh, software engineering communities. So it's like a, a singularity sector of uh, unmaintained tools. So if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, but this is really important uh, uh, milestones that have uh, been done to achieve mutation testing uh, for the uh, projects in Java. So, but currently nowadays, PIT uh, is a tool to go for. Internal working of the mutation uh, testing tool will uh, be split in these four phases. So first of it is mutation generation. Uh, then uh, test selection, so which uh, tests should be executed to evaluate this uh, specific uh, mutant, this uh, change, a uh, potential bug that being injected. Uh, then mutant insertion, so um, uh, mutant would be loaded in GVM. So in some uh, different, in different tools, these phases can be mixed together to achieve different levels of performance. And uh, the last step is a mutation, a mutant detection. So just run your test and see Will it fail or not? Um, so you can find information about the PIT tool and the PIT test org. Um, the key features that you would like to know uh, and maybe discuss it with your team if you would like to implement it is that it requires a Java 5 or above. It's compatible with GUnit or TestNG. Uh, it, uh, can be used with GUnit 4.6 plus. It also means that you can actually use some tests written for GUnit 3. Uh, GUnit 5 uh, can be used with a plugin. Uh, it also really nicely works with most uh, of the uh, mocking uh, libraries. Uh, you can uh, integrate it with a Maven or Gradle. It has also uh, plugins for Eclipse and IntelliJ. This is really convenient. I will show it a little bit later. And it supports incremental analysis. You will uh, benefit from it in a big project set will take some time to analyze. To integrate it with Maven, you just define extra plugin dependency, and that would be enough for you to call the, the specific goals uh, on your Maven project, like org pit test, pit test Maven, mutation coverage, and you will be presented uh, with a report about uh, mutants uh, with uh, details in about your source code. You can also uh, configure it really uh, in many ways. Um, the full documentation maintained fresh on the website. So for example, you can uh, narrow the target classes that you want and uh, target uh, tests that supposed to be taken in consideration. So really nicely tunable. And if you have uh, more hardware, you can uh, speed it up because uh, what you probably were thinking already, but how expensive it is to run the mutant tests, mutation testing. So, because there is so many places and applications that could be changed, it would be like uh, hundreds and not, if not the thousands of possible permutations of your code. And each of these permutations you have to run through your tests. So it can take a while. That's why mutation testing considered really expensive uh, exercise to do for your code base. But if you have more hardware and you're using the pits, you can define how many threads you want to use. And like on this uh, wonderful picture, you will have everything uh, evaluated much faster in parallel and uh, yeah, just buy more hardware. Um, it also will provide you really nice verbose reports. So uh, you can, uh, it can generate HTML reports. So really uh, you cannot imagine much more uh, GUI way of understanding what the mutation test did. So it will highlight the lines of code that it exercised and what kind of mutations it applied for each of them. For example, to line number six, it was three different mutants applied. And for line number 14, five different mutants. And you have a description of what actually tried to do with your code and 
did it, uh, went through your test suite. So it was doing a replacement of Boolean return with a true. So try, try to just drop all kind of um, uh, expressions here in the first place. And for example, for line uh, 14, the boundary uh, the between uh, function had not enough uh, good coverage. And actually it found out that uh, it doesn't even cover this kind of uh, edge cases. So it will also highlight for you that uh, some of the uh, mutants actually survived. So really verbose, really easy to interpret and understand what it did. So I have really positive uh, experience using this tool. It also has a, a the plugins. Uh, personally, I used the most uh, plugin for IntelliJ, one of the most uh, popular IDs for Java development. So you can leverage the same thing. to it adds uh, just a GUI interface to the same things that you can do in the in Maven or Gradle, but then you don't have to uh, uh, talk to Maven Gradle. You can just uh, run a specific uh, um, profile and it would just yeah, return you the same reports. So really convenient, uh, really creates your personal environment to run the mutation testing. And one thing that I would like to show the last but not least, it's uh, to not forget about your team. So uh, you developing in a Java, but uh, you have other uh, layers of your application probably, and you have uh, team members that are doing, for example, uh, front-end development, and they're using different technologies, and you should know how to uh, share the same methodology with all team that uh, you're working with. So the overview of a full stack zoo would look like that. Uh, so for Java, I already mentioned the bits, for JavaScript, C Sharp, and Scala, I really recommend using a striker, uh, maintain today really good features, really fast, and uh, I really enjoyed using it. For Ruby, it would be Mutant, for PHP, Humburg, and maybe much more that I'm not aware, but uh, you can always find more. So if you really appreciate mutation testing, you can share it with your team later. So striker has the same amount of features as a bit, so it's also fast. Uh, it can be extended by some plugins as a uh, P does, for example, for the unit five. So Striker also has a similar uh, philosophy behind it. And it also will generate you really nice uh, reports. And it also can be run in, in the multiple threads in parallel. So you can achieve uh, the same uh, performance improvement if you just pimp up more hardware to your uh, workflow. Really verbose uh, coverage reports that will explain what exactly being done to uh, prove that your test suite is not good enough. And um, at the end, I would like to show uh, one of these examples about the mutation testing. So on the top, you see the coverage report for uh, some just demo application. And it says that it's perfect and uh, everything is covered. But on the bottom, you mutation uh, a report will show you that it's not so good situation there. So that can help you to save a lot of time if you're onboarding some legacy code or uh, you joining the team and you want to know uh, to understand what's going on and how the best way you can help the processes in your team. So don't lock your bicycle like that. Um, get better insights. And one of the ways to do that is to run mutation testing. Uh, small advices on how to apply it in your team and uh, daily development. One of the advices would be to not uh, put it in your delivery pipeline because it's really expensive and long process. And the bigger the source code, the longer mutation tests will take. So don't try to make it obligatory uh, step. Do not enforce a minimum detection rate. So how much mutants allowed to survive, for example. Some of the mutants can be irrelevant in your case and you would be really happy to just ignore them and it's okay. So I will advise you to uh, use it not like uh, enforced uh, uh, rate, but uh, to make some kind of uh, collaborative uh, decision of your team when the rate uh, should be considered uh, to action. So when it's really bad, then what you will do. So try to treat it as a helper for you to improve, but not as a goal to achieve. 
So you can always run it locally or you can uh, make it part of your uh, continuous integration uh, and get reports regularly on daily basis uh, or as soon as you merge something to the uh, important branches and uh, just plan the time to analyze and understand what this mutation mean because some of them again say can be irrelevant uh, for your use case. That was all overview of a mutation testing and tools for doing it. Some experience of implementing it in my team. Um, just quick overview what we went through. So we get also some insight for uh, full stack teams. Uh, there was overview of how to use uh, the PIT in form of uh, uh, executing goals from Maven or Gradle or as a plugin. Um, also, what is mutation testing uh, alternatives you have as a Java developer, what mutation testing is as a definition, uh, examples of uh, code coverage and uh, discussions about um, what other metrics you can derive. Example was why would you like to insert the bugs to challenge your test suite? And uh, don't forget, we will get some insights about the questions. Uh, so how many people using unit tests and uh, yeah, so how much people trust them. So thank you very much for your attention. And now we can go to the question and answer section. Okay, uh, it's time for the Q&A. So Fadim, if you would be so kind to yeah, turn on your webcam. Ah, there you go. Um, before we go into the uh, Menti results, I'm really curious, but uh, first we're gonna answer some questions. And the first question is, which mutation set would you suggest for people learning to use mut mutation testing tools? And also regarding convincing management so that you're uh, allowed to spend time on them. I would suggest uh, for for tools, I understand which tools will you choose. So for the Java developers, just go with Pit. Uh, don't try to use this other tools that been famous uh, like 10 years ago. And with uh, for front-end developers, really use Striker. It's really easy to configure, like in Maven projects for Pit, just one line, your dependencies, one line, your packages on, and uh, you have your stuff running. Mm -hmm. So about uh, convincing the management, I don't think you have to convince it because they know the amount of uh, production bugs that uh, team producing and uh, you can just put it side to side, your production bugs and the cover reports. Mm -hmm. If they not match to each other, you have your point to just show the next slide with mutation score and all questions would be gone. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um, next question would be um what is the most complicated barrier for a, a team to start adapting a mutation testing it was understanding of what is uh, mutants is and what mutation score is so you have to get this mentality that uh, developers ready to accept that uh, they code not perfect mm -hmm. and for example in one of my teams we had uh, really good coverage reports but it was really long living projects so developers was constantly shifting so it looked like really good and we had a lot of proud developers also, but as soon as we started to run mutation testing, there is like second thought, okay, maybe I'm missing something. And then you get challenged and this actually creates uh, two positive effects. So first of all, your developers get challenged. So why didn't I cover it as I thought I did? And then you also have improvement uh, uh, of your test suite. So mm -hmm. um, the main thing is to explain why you want it and what's actually going on because Mutation testing sounds really like magical and sometimes really vague. You have to see examples and after that uh, you you really want it. Okay, great. Um, last question out of the chat is, do you have a demo to show uh, pit testing? Do you have a Git repo that you could share in chat, for instance? I would recommend to use a main web page. So in the chat, I've seen already people collected URLs of the two tools that I mentioned, so the pit test. Mm -hmm. And the striker, they have really good updated fresh documentation that I already mentioned in the slide. So I would really trust to uh, use uh, their resources as advisory. So I could not prepare any better material and demo sets that they already created on the websites mm -hmm. after the years of uh, uh, advocating for uh, this way of uh, testing. Okay, fair enough. Okay, great. Um, then uh, let's stop uh, the suspense. Can you show the uh, the Menti results? Oh yeah, really this was curious. actually really interesting. Um, I hope you see the video already. Hmm? 
Do you see the video already? Oh, not? yes, I see. Uh, your screen is being shared. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it was being shared. The here. wrong one, screen oh. two. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So uh, on the screen two, you should see the diagram, pie chart diagram. Yes. So really good done, 96% using unit tests. Uh, I think it's really great achievement, but we still have someone who doesn't. It's probably startups and hackathon people. So I can understand you. So you can sometimes uh, not do it on the hackathons, but this slide I really like the most <laughs> every time. So nobody trusts someone else unit tests. And I actually can concur with this. Uh, with this opinion of uh, our audience today. So it's always better when you wrote it and you know how it works, mm -hmm. but uh, to uh, remove this vagueness of uh, of this uncertainty, 94% of people can use actually tools as mutation testing to get uh, finally some statement. Do you trust it or not to make it certain? Yeah. Okay, well, great, really nice results. Um, Farim, thanks again for... Um... Uh, for your nice presentation about uh, mutation testing in practice for uh, JFOL. Um, as for today, this is the last session for JFOL for today. Uh, don't forget to log in, come back again tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we will start at half past three, uh, three thirty. Uh, so I hope to see you then. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.